Good day from the Comrade Stalin to Mr. Reigns, Comrade Lenin. Good day. It's my Russian accent. Very good. Today we're talking about the struggle for power. Um, why the struggle for power? What's going on? Well, Lenin's biggest problem in life is that he didn't live forever. And despite his, uh, his best intentions, he dies um, in 1924. And what happens is that Russia, the Soviet Union, becomes embroiled in a competition between leading communists to see who will be Lenin's successor. Uh, we have a number of key players, and what we see eventually happening, and what this lesson is really about, is how Joseph Stalin takes over from Lenin. Uh, a man who at the start of 1924 is underrated, if you're a betting man yes. or woman, you would probably not go into a betting shop on the high road and put money on Stalin taking over if you were able to bet on things in 1924 because there are seemingly m many other contenders. But in the end, Stalin wins. And this lesson really looks at why he's able to progressively side with various groups, how he's able to one by one remove his party rivals until only he is left as the natural successor to Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. So the first thing... Deceased. Lenin um, suffers a series of strokes from about 1921-1922 onwards. Um, he, by 1922, he's essentially um, uh, in a wheelchair, very find it very difficult to speak and find um, work very, very tiring. So he doesn't really get to grips with the day-to-day -day leadership um, and doesn't do the day-to-day -day decisions. That's left to the Politburo, the Politburo being the biggest, the top committee which runs the Bolshevik party. Um, we're going to talk all these sort of names, but all you have to remember is Politburo is at the top. Um, interestingly, Stalin, even from this point, is controlling the information that Lenin's being able to see. Um, the, uh, the guards, the, or as they say, guards, the servants who are effectively guards, are, are around um, uh, Lenin are strictly employed and are loyal to Stalin, and they make sure no bad information gets to him. Um, in fact, Lenin, as we shall see, is increasingly concerned about Stalin and the power Stalin has. Uh, and we'll see this has drastic consequences later, um, until he dies in 1924. So remember that fact. One of the Stalin's key advantages, as we'll see, when we consider where he is in the Socialist, uh, sorry, in the Communist Party and within the, the Politburo, the High Committee of the Soviets, um, where he is allows him to get away with controlling access to Lenin. You'll see how that plays out once we look at all of the other people involved. But let's do a little bit of a run-through of the key contenders, shall we? Leon Trotsky. He's the front-runner. He's your boy. You remember Leon Trotsky. He's running around everywhere during the Civil War. He's giving inspiring speeches. He was a Menshevik who went over to the Bolshevik side before the October Revolution. He's a master of organization. He's talented. He's intelligent. He's a war hero. He's a good organizer. He's Lenin's buddy, favored by Lenin to take over. He's massively popular, too. The radical left of his party love him. Of course, um, he has control over the army, going back to his days of the Civil War. He's a commissar of war. He does have a few enemies, though. Um, here are some points that actually point to the fact that Trotsky might have a few problems as a natural next successor. He's arrogant. He believes in himself a little bit too much, which makes him also sort of rude. He was never an original Bolshevik, as I mentioned. He'd come over just before the October Revolution. He was an ex-Menshevik. Um, he did not bother to get a lot of supporters in the party. He sort of assumed he would be the natural next successor, so he didn't have a lot of uh, people pulling behind the scenes for him. Um, he was prone to exaggeration. He focused on arguments rather than deals and alliances to win. He was increasing illness, and in the days um, uh, in the days before um, the, I guess the Holocaust and things like that, where anti-Semitism was rife in Europe. He was also Jewish. So Trotsky clearly, although he is an arrogant um, and non, not very good at the high politics to actually win a grubby power struggle, he's clearly a front runner. There are a couple of other con um, contenders that we'll, we'll go through very quickly. You never need to know too much about these chats, but you need to know that they exist and have a broad sense of them. So the first one is Zinoviev. 
Gregory Zinoviev is a relatively young old Bolshevik. Old Bolshevik means they were they were there from the start. They were there Bolshevik before it was cool, to be honest. Um, and he was a member of the left who was on slight on slightly on the outside by 1924. Um, he was not really massively liked by Lenin. He disagreed with Lenin over many things, including whether they should do the um, October Revolution like Kamenev. Um, and so therefore, though he was important and had a lot of friends, he was not a natural successor. His, um, in his favour, he had been a long time in the party, which meant he had lots of friends in the party. And he was the party secretary for Leningrad, basically the person in charge of Leningrad, which means that he has a lot of his key supporters. He only promotes people he likes and this will support him um, in Leningrad. Leningrad being one of the major cities in Russia means he's got a lot of supporters in a lot of very important places. If you're the party secretary to some backwater Siberian town, you're not very important. Who cares? But if you're responsible for controlling the factories, the military, the police, and the local government of one of the biggest cities in Russia, then you have a lot of influence. Against him, he's not particularly intelligent. He's not liked by a majority of members, or um, not by other members, or much by average people outside Leningrad. In fact, Lenin was on record at saying um, that Zinoviev defies logic in the matter as someone who can speak so highly and lack in the basic wit beneath his eyes. Similar to that, we have Kamenev. They called Kamenev the grand old man of the party. He was not really on the left of the party, wasn't he, Mr. Suter? Very much so. Um, he was um, an old school. He's very, very ideological. He, he read everything about Marx. He thought about things. He sat in his study, long, thinking about treatises about Marx. He was a very, very um, intellectual figure to some extent. He had been trusted by Lenin as a reliable pair of hands and therefore had got a lot of high esteem because Lenin did know that this is a man you could trust. Okay, he was liked by the other Bolsheviks. He wasn't arrogant. He wasn't rude. He wasn't harsh. He was a gentleman and a, um, who would care more about the ideas rather than grubby politics. And as such, was put as party secretary of Moscow. And again, he's in charge of the of everything that runs in Moscow. This gives him a lot of latent power. Against him, though, he had opposed the October Revolution. Um, and he's been, every, and this feeds into this image of Kamenev that everyone has, that he's just this weak, dodgy old man who's out of touch, who doesn't really want to take risks. Not certainly not party material, and certainly not leader of the Bolshevik material. And despite being liked, no one really thought he was an effective leader. In fact, Kamenev didn't think he was an effective leader, and would prefer to just um, keep his budgie, um, at, who's called Engels. Um, Mark, Marx's pa partner, um, and think about pontificate almost on the nature of, of um, Bolshevik politics and on political ideas. Um, and he didn't even really seem to have the stomach or want to become leader himself. Although he throws himself his name into the ring, as you shall see, he doesn't really follow up. He doesn't try and make alliances. He doesn't try and outflank Stalin. He doesn't really do anything. He just sort of an old man who just goes along with it. He's too nice for this grubby, brutal, backstabbing battle that we're going to see. Imagine Mean Girls and then some just nice old man dodging about. That's pretty much what we're seeing in the, in the Bolshevik party. All right. On the other hand, we have Nikolai Bukharin. Um, he's an interesting character. He's young. He's relatively right-wing, which means he's not a hard, hardcore communist. He's also incredibly intelligent, which was probably his greatest skill. In fact, Lenin recognized him as the golden boy. He, the golden boy. <laughs> I can think of about six other people in the department who deserve that title before you. But anyways, I can digress. Um, uh, the, <laughs> he's recognized as a golden boy. Lenin sees that there's actual political potential for Buchanan couple major issues, though. Um, he had argued against Lenin. His propensity to overthink things uh, led him to make a fundamental mistake, because you don't argue with Lenin. And Bukharin argued with Lenin, and that reduces his stock in Lenin's eyes, importantly. Um, he also supported the NEP, so the hardcore communists in the group, the guys who didn't like the NEP because it was too capitalist, um, don't like Bukharin because he did support the NEP. And he's also seen as too young. Um, therefore, he lacked political cunning. He hadn't been around in a while. Absolutely right. So that's a nice summary of the sort of key contenders. We've got Trotsky, the, ma the golden man, the man who's almost certainly going to win it, the natural successor, who is an arrogant, aloof uh, individual who doesn't really 
who sees himself as above grubby power politics. You've got um, Zinoviev, who sees himself as a genius, but everyone thinks he's an idiot. Kamenev, who's a nicely dodgy old man. Bukharin, the young intellectual who's a bit dubious and doesn't quite know his place and is a bit seen as often a little bit too right wing. Coming into this, we have the most unlikely of contenders, Josef Stalin. He is underestimated, as we all see, by almost all his party, everyone in the party. He was highly cunning and highly political skilled, but most people did not see that. And this is a, a real secret of Stalin's success. It's not until well into the purges, 1934, when pretty much everyone in we've already mentioned is dead, apart from Trotsky, um, and he'll get an ice pick to the face in due course, um, that people realize that Joseph Stalin is a political genius. On the outside, there's this Georgian um, uh, individual who's not even Russian, speaks with a funny accent, made his name as a bank robber, not an intellectual, in the um, Bolshevik party, um, worked his way up because he worked very hard, and got himself the position of general secretary. Now, this is the first thing that gives him lots and lots of power. The position of general secretary was shunned by the other members of the Bolshevik Party. It was seen as beneath them. It was seen as petty bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is paperwork. Um, Stalin took the job, and I was like, oh, let's give Stalin that. It's, it's, he's, he'll just carry on signing those forms. It's adorable. Look at him. But as you'll see, this position of general secretary is incredibly powerful. Um, the position ends up giving um, Stalin an advantage over and to have control over the... Um, party. We'll talk about it in much more detail later. But he's basically allowed to pick, pick people who, in, who are in positions of party below him. He's allowed to choose who are in key positions in the party congress and even the Politburo. And he's even allowed to add members or remove members. And these are all administrative tasks. Everyone else is focusing on theory. What should we do about the economy? What should we do about world revolution? What should we do about this or that? And there's Stalin doing his paperwork. No one suspects that this is a position to get a lot of power, as we shall see, within the party. And it's from that base of power you're able to get rid of people. Because actually, what determines if you're in or out of the party, if you win or lose the battle, is not if you have the best arguments. It's if you are able to outvote the other side. And if you're the person who picks everyone's jobs, and you give everyone a job, and gets their loyalty if they want to get promotion and can kick people out if they're being quote unquote disloyal you have a lot of ability to rig that vote i hope you have your pens ready here because there are a few notes i want you to make the first thing and the first key aspect of lenin's political skill that you should write down is or sorry lenin rather stalin's political skill you should write down is the fact that he was a great judge of character stalin could figure out who his enemies were who his friends were, and he knew exactly who to marginalize, in other words, to keep out, and who to bring closer to aid him. So he was a great judge of character. The second aspect of his political skill is he was utterly and truly ruthless. It did not matter to him what methods he took or how he took it. If his idea or his uh, goal was to gain power, he would be utterly, utterly ruthless in the acquisition of that power, leaving no person uh, in, his, in his way. Those are really his major two political skills that he's able to use. Um, he has also he's always knows how to, what to, to who he can bribe and who he can keep in line as well. Um, and as um, a result of all of this, um, this the image of most um, communist party members was slightly condescending. Condescending basically means you can look down on them, much like as you can imagine, history department does to our esteemed colleagues, backwater Canadian back, sort of bumbling background. Um, he's seen as this. Um, bureaucratic administrator who is not very intellectual, not very good at understanding the high um, points of communism, not very good at in a debate, who just quietly takes notes in the meetings. But look, as we shall see, that gives him a lot of power. He is constantly underestimated by opponents. As you will see, there are plenty of opportunities for his opponents to destroy him. And because they think, oh, it's only Stalin, they ignore him, they ignore his threat until it's too late. Okay, so... How does this all play out? The first major step towards the succession of Lenin actually takes place while Lenin is still alive. Lenin realizes his days are up. Um, 
he's ill, he suffered from strokes, he's, he's effectively dying. And he writes his last will and testament. And in his testament, he makes um, varied comments about the people rivaling uh, each other for the number one job in the Russian Communist Party. Now, um, Lenin has this published, and it's widely read. And in his testament, he is heavily, heavily critical of just about everybody running. He, no, no, no one is spared in his testament. However, he is much less critical of Leon Trotsky, but highly, highly, highly critical of Joseph Stalin. Um, particularly in the postscript, the end, which he says that Stalin should be removed. When he died, his, tenants, his testament was passed to the Politburo, which decided, in the end, we won't publish it. I mean, and what's key here is to understand why. Stalin has been, if, has been given a death blow here. Lenin is seen as almost semi-godlike. If he says that someone should be removed, he should be removed. Um, but um, what ends up happening is the Politburo look at this dodgery old Stalin and think, well, we could get rid of him, but why would we need to? He's not a fro threat. If they publish it, yeah, Stalin's got rid of, but if anything, the guy that everyone's rivaling, who everyone fears will take over, Trotsky, will be helped. And every member, Kamenev, Bukharin, Zinoviev, and loads of others are all criticised. They don't want Lenin criticising them on record. That will make them look weaker. They prefer to keep it quiet. Why do they need to worry about getting rid of Stalin anyway? It's best to make sure that Trotsky doesn't look strong and they don't get criticised. I should preface what I said a minute ago with a, a little bit of a, a clarity. I, I, when I said widely read, I was indicating it was widely read amongst the leadership contenders and the people high up in the Bolshevik party. This wasn't for public consumption, but that's just to clarify something. So what happens to Lenin? Well, Lenin, as I as alluded to, doesn't live forever. Um, Lenin dies in January 1924. Um, he has a, an absolutely spectacular funeral um, held in Moscow. And Stalin, uh, as in his position of general secretary, is an effectively coordinated or tasked with organizing this massive public event. Of course, he is the secretary. He's the organization man. And Stalin decides to take the opportunity to ensure that he is photographed and filmed by Lenin's side at every point. This is something covered by world media, something covered by heavily by Russian media, and everywhere you look, Joseph Stalin has positioned himself in the order of events right next to Lenin. So, um, he's doing this for one very clear reason. Stalin, ever the political genius, is realizing that after the um, removal of Lenin, what's on the death of Lenin, there's going to be a battle for leadership. And whoever the Russian people think is um, Lenin's natural successor, i.e. the person Lenin wanted to follow him, um, has the most amount of claim to become the new leader. What Stalin is doing by putting himself, as you can see in that photo, right next to Lenin, is he's trying to already and um, make himself seem like he is the one that Lenin always liked straight all, all along. That's wrong. That's a complete lie. If anything, Lenin hated him the most, particularly by the end when he realized how cunning Stalin was. But that doesn't matter because Lenin is now dead. That picture we saw at the very start of the lesson, the one with Lenin and Stalin side by side, is actually fake. It's them, him create, joining up both of them. But then this is another example of how Len Stalin is using his political skill to join them together. So, um, as well as this, Stalin is again very clever. And I've never quite just <laughs> squared this up because Stalin tells Trotsky that he was, <laughs> he was ill, that the funeral was on the wrong date. Like, the most basic of, 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 of lies. And Trotsky goes along with it. Um, so Trotsky doesn't attend Lenin's funeral. So the world's media, the Russian media, see all these people, all these chief Bolsheviks, but Trotsky, who I remember, already has a reputation for being arrogant and aloof. Um, uh, and so aside, doesn't attend the funeral. People are like, what's Le Trotsky thinking? Does he think he's better than Lenin? And then this, this is seen as, again, as evidence of arrogance. Now, Stalin has entirely set Trotsky up here. Trotsky was ill and he had told him the wrong date. And it, this is very deliberate by Stalin to try and make Lenin, make um, Trotsky look like a side person, um, a side figure who is too arrogant for Lenin. But... You've got to blame Trotsky at some point in this. Like, who gets the wrong date for... <laughs> who do you throw like on Stalin? Everybody in Russia went to the funeral. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> oh, well. Anyways, Trotsky screws up. Lenin, Lenin does trick him. And it's an, a, another example of his cunning political skill. So moving on. 
What we were left with then after Lenin's death is a few visions of what should happen. Trotsky, the leading contender, argues for a, effectively a permanent state of revolution. The idea that if the revolution, the communist takeover of Russia, was to survive, it would have to um, serve and spread communism into other countries. And in fact, during these years, Russia is heavily involved in fostering revolution in countries like Britain, Germany, France, Italy. Um, Trotsky's idea of permanent revolution is contrasted very much with Stalin's. And Stalin looks to isolate Trotsky and argues that Russia is strong enough on its own. And we don't, in, we don't need permanent revolution. We don't need to be spending our energies on encouraging revolution in countries I don't quite frankly care about, like Italy or Britain or whatever it happens to be. We need, according to Stalin, socialism in one country. Let's focus on our own house, not the houses of our friends. I think the key thing about socialism in one country, it, it was a really, like, it meant whatever Stalin wanted to mean at any one time. At times, socialism in one country meant NEP. At times, it didn't mean NEP. At times, it meant um, a control of it, a sort of pseudo go back to um, war communism. What it basically meant was not in terms of direct policy, it meant that um, Russia, we can do it on our own. This is deliberately meant to appeal to Russians. If, you, if there's Trotsky, remember, Jewish, see there's not Russian, you know, a bit aloof, a bit, un, you know, a bit intellectual, which doesn't fit in with the, the Russian idea themselves. There's Trotsky saying, we couldn't possibly survive unless we spread our revolution. And there's Stalin going, we are strong enough, we can do it, um, we are patriotic. Stalin, by Stalin proposing that, it's, um, that Russia will solve its own problem and beat the West, it's appealing to that gut patriotism of Russians. This is, again, really good evidence of Stalin's political skill. He understands what the Russian people want. Trotsky's got a more valid argument. Trotsky's got a good, well-argued, well-reasoned argument. But this is Russia. This is mass politics. The average illiterate president doesn't care about the, the, the um, whatever argument uh, Trotsky has said in um, Politburo behind closed doors. Stalin's, we are strong Russians, we can do better than everyone else, plays well. It also helps make Trotsky look unpatriotic, like he thinks that Russia is too weak to manage, and Russians are too weak to survive um, without um, revolution being um, spread. So, Stalin also, behind the scenes, from pretty much Lenin's um, uh, 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 death, dominates the party and he does this for a number of ways okay so we'll talk you i'm going to talk you through this quickly you can read you can read onto this in more detail but basically number one he could some ex to some extent set the agenda for what's discussed in the politburo uh, he controlled what was discussed what was not discussed and when it was discussed which gives him an element of power as he oversees the base <coughs> the agenda of what's going on um he gets to be in charge of appointing the most uh, people into most of the major jobs, and as such has a lot of power. He can curry influence and favor, trade off good jobs for support in his leadership campaign, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and also, too, he's able to pick loyal people, people who are Stalin supporters in the leadership contest, and basically hold their loyalty because to him they owed their jobs, and moreover, they owed to him future promotion. Um, this ensured that these people, quote unquote, voted the right way when it came time to vote for who was leader of the I Communist Party. I think that's really key because the job of the Party Congress is to kick out other people. So if you say you want to kick out Trotsky, the Party Congress has to say yes. If you control Party Congress, then you control which way people are going to vote, and therefore you can make sure that you always win. So as such, he said he. Um, is able to influence and, in many cases, decide which delegates are sent to the party congress and where the central committee and major policy ideas are chosen. Um, he could therefore pack the congresses with supporters to make sure they always, again, vote the right way, just as Mr. Souter alluded to. And finally, of course, he controls party membership. So he could remove or enroll party members as he thought necessary to back his leadership campaign. He reduced the number of radical students and soldiers. These are people who generally would follow Trotsky. And he increases the, uh, the number of Lenin enrollments in 1924 and 1925. Um, these Lenin enrollments are largely 
badly educated working classes who are just doing it to get money and a job. They know they're not there for the ideology. They're not there for the ideas. They're there to do what they're told and get promoted. And these are exactly the sort of people Stalin likes. He doesn't want people who have their own thoughts. He wants people who will do what they're told and take a promotion. And this Lenin enrollment increases the number of members, doubles it to one million, which, again, gives Stalin a lot of control. Yeah, just to clarify, the term Lenin enrollment isn't it doesn't really have anything to do with Lenin. It's just sort of a token name given to um, people who are enrolled in the Communist Party. It's just to make it sound good, if anything, yeah. from there. Jo yeah. Join because of jo – join, show your support for Lenin. Absolutely right. Our dead hero, yada, yada. So we now move on to the battles between the various groups. So the first person is, which is, who is turned on is Trotsky. Trotsky is, uh, all the other contenders decide to take on Trotsky. So Trotsky seems a natural leader who's going to naturally win. So as he is the biggest threat, Stalin, Kamen, and Zinovia, Bukhara, and everyone um, decide that they're going to take him on. Trotsky speaks well um, at his um, at Politburo and the Central Committee, but is outvoted in the 1924 Congress and is humiliated. The Congress, by, remember, which is largely appointed by Stalin. In 1925, Kamenev and Zinoviev attack him and force him to resign as commissar for war. This is a stupid plan on behalf of Trotsky, and this is one of his major weaknesses, because now he doesn't have control of the Red Army. If you have control of the army, you can force what you want. But because Trotsky um, didn't want to be, get involved in grubby politics, he decided to keep his position. And as well as that, um, by 1925, Trotsky and all his supporters are all but destroyed, as socialism in one country is introduced. And Trotsky is marginalised by the end of 1925. And a year or two later, as we shall see, he will be expelled. So Stalin, Zinoviev, Kamenev have all ganged up in Trotsky. That leaves the next two strongest people, Kamenev and Zinoviev. So what does Stalin do? He allies, he allies himself with Bukharin. And him, Stalin, controlling the party with his membership, teams up with Bukharin and his supporters, and they remove Kamenev and Zinoviev, ending the left-wing threat from the party. And by the end of 1925, these two gentlemen are removed from the leadership competition. Of course, they attack him back for support of the NEP, but they lack the support in the Congress. And in 1926, they're both voted down and out, and those two effective rivals are removed. Um, in 1927, by vote, of course, and in a Stalin-controlled Congress, the... the Congress votes to expel Kamenev, Zinoviev, and Trotsky from the Communist Party. You see a common theme here, votes in Congress controlled by Stalin, the, position, the power of position in General Secretary. So who's left? Good old young Bukharin. What happens? Of course Stalin then takes on the right. Um, he decides that um, the right are never massively popular in a way. No one really loves the NEP. So they like the idea, but they don't like capitalists, they don't like kulaks. So he turns on and says, NEP is too capitalist. And instead, we should have socialism in one country, which now means something else. Before, so against Kamenev Zinoviev, socialism in one country meant the NEP. Now it means we need to control factories to industrialize to make Russia strong. In 1929, um, uh, Stalin controls the Party Congress. Bukharin is outvoted and forced to resign as head of the Comet Turn and the Politburo. He's not removed from power yet, he's not exiled until later, but he's removed as a force. By the end, therefore, of 1929, Stalin is the only contender left. He has progressively taken out each group in turn, and at every stage, people have let him because they think he's just a plodding um, idiot who can just do the basic stuff, but is not has no political skill. And using his position of General Secretary, he has ensured that he takes over so, power. Just an important note on that last bit, is that in Russia, during this time, between the death of Lenin in 1924 and 1929, when Stalin really is the unopposed leader of the Russian uh, Communist Party, and, and by extension Russia itself, we have a situation where Russia isn't run by any one individual. It's run by committee. And that committee is increasingly controlled by Stalin and through his power and through his uh, political skills and maneuvering is able to succeed for the various factors mentioned above. He's got the general secretary. He plays on the weaknesses of his political opponents and he uses his political skill to marginalize his other opponents, outvote them, expel them from the Communist Party and leave himself as the last man standing and the successor to Lenin, which he does successfully by 1929. That's all we have for today. Thank you very much.